Hello and most welcome to 2047 of the series. We will today continue with Ian McGilchrist, The Matter with Things. And we are at chapter 34, page 980. He's speaking about flow and patterns and resistance and how resistance and flow are deeply connected. And now we just started with motion and cognition. Motion and cognition. Motion and cognition. And how the moving factor in the, wor the world makes cognition something that we earlier mentioned in context with fractality, how the iterations bring about movement. And that moving feature, that lies at the very core of reality. That is what is cognition, the iterative ability of our system to take in something different, something exogenous, and in that difference, bring forward, bring to the fore something new, something giving, adding, making for the next turn of the spiral, as I mentioned before, the spiral. <laughs> that is in itself a development. So we don't have the circle of the origo. There is an advancement. The iterative non-repetitive or not repetitive in the identical sense, but bringing forward new things, moreness, expanse, development. That is a huge difference to the Newtonian stillness of no development, no accumulation of understanding where everything comes to a standstill and knowledge become becomes things to be grasped to be grasped and in the non-developmental side We are static subjects looking out on the object situated firmly in space. In this vision that has been proposed already since antiquities, since antiquity. There's a stern reliance on the other in the iterative situation, whether but in the subject in front of space of 
in front of object in space, there is no taking in of other. Rather, we have there a huge distance, no closeness. It is far away. And the distance makes for obscure thinking, obscure knowledge, non participatory knowledge. Not as well founded and nourishing because there is great nourishment in the fractality itself. In that we have a development. And we mention this also in context with words. It's true to say that words often comes in retrospect, in the stillness of looking on the floating features of life in an aftermath, in an a posteriori mode. Where stillness abide. It's sort of lifeless, not as enhancing, not nourishing or giving knowledge. It is like the coastline of Norway were to be flattened out, becoming linear, having no access to the, the complex fractality of knowledge, where the inner is the surface, when we reach out out into the exogenous, we also enforce the endogenous, the insideness. And I will continue to read on page 980. 980. This was 130 years ago. The idea that thought depended on bodily movement did not fit with the scientific prejudices of the age. The close relationship between embodiedness and cognition is now appreciated, but conventionally has not been taken into account in the, in the <laughs> analytic tradition of philosophy, which has been happy to entertain, for instance, accounts of brains in vats as, as useful ways to arrive at an understanding of the human mind, of the human mind. It is only in recent years that we have begun to take notice of and learned very much more about the role of the body in cognition. In cognition. Mm. 
the argument that the contribution of literal and explicit thinking is minimal compared with largely metaphorical unconscious thinking rooted in the body was put forward by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson in the metaphors we live by and philosophy in the flesh. And Guy Claxton has marshaled an impressive array of evidence. that takes the argument further in his intelligence in the flesh. Intelligence in the flesh, very interesting. We think through the body, writes Matt Crawford. Matt Crawford, even more interesting. The boundary of our cognitive processes cannot be cleanly drawn at the outer surface of our skulls or indeed of our bodies more generally, more generally. They are in a sense distributed in the world that we act in, in the world that we act in. I'd like to consider motion from a number of different angles each of which may tell us something different about its significance, something different about its significance. First, I will look at what brain structure and function, both normal and abnormal, can tell us about the part played by motion in different aspects of our experience. In different aspects of our experience. that will lead naturally to a consideration of the relationship between motion and various aspects of the psychology of phenomenon, phenom phenomenal experience, thinking, feeling, perceiving, and social intelligence. Social intelligence. From there, I will, I will venture into some reflections on motion in ontological terms. What I aim to show is that motion is at the core of every aspect of our ex 
experience and of our ability to make sense of it in a way of which we are normally unaware. Normally unaware. Normally unaware. <laughs> because our analytic intellect cannot deal with it. And that motion is foundational to existence. And stillness merely the limit case of motion. Not stillness primary and motion some form of aberration or disturbance of the foundational inertia of the foundational inertia Motion and cognition in the brain, in the brain. Mind and body are inseparably connected. Mind and body are inseparably connected. The conventional divide between thinking and motor function simply can no longer be supported. Supported. The dichotomy is in fact entirely misleading as has been confirmed in a number of interesting ways. In a number of interesting ways. And some of the evidence once again comes from diseases of the nervous system. <laughs> of diseases of the nervous system. We know that just thinking about a certain activity motivates parts of the brain connected with performing the action and causes subtle changes in tone of the relevant musculature. So much is thinking bound up with bodily action, bodily action. Just reading action words activates motor systems, words such as kick or lick change activity in those areas of the brain having input to the legs and mouth respectively. Equal. 
equally. The converse is true. Movements of the hands affect the processing of words for actions involving the hands. And the same is true of feet. Reading nouns with strong taste, smell or sound associations has been shown to activate the relevant sensory brain regions. The relevant sensory brain regions. When we When we comprehend sentences, we internally simulate the state of the world described in them. The term motor cognition has been adopted to cover those aspects of cognition involving planning, executing, understanding and imagining bodily movements and actions, actions. The close connection between thinking and moving is evident to in pathology. In pathology. In pathology. Some of the same proteins and genes are involved in both classically motor diseases such as motor neuron disease and in classically cognitive diseases such as frontal, frontotemporal dementia. dementia. Frontotemporal dementia. In what used to be thought of as purely movement disorders, we now recognize that aspects of cognition are affected. 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 <laughs> affected. <laughs> For example, motor neuron disease, as it, its name suggests, has been conventionally thought of as affecting only the neurons of the peripheral nervous system, of the peripheral nervous system. Ones that convey motor commands to muscles, to muscles.
to a large extent, this is correct. But more recently, physicians have become aware that patients with motor neurone disease have word-finding difficulties. Word-finding difficulties. In fact, clear language deficits can be detected in about half of the patients with motor neuron disease. In motor neuron disease. <gasps> What is significant is that in these conditions, it is the retrieval of action words that is principally affected. Principally affected. According to the neurologist Thomas Bach, Thomas Bach, a leading figure in the world of embodied cognition pathology, every single reported patient with motor neuron disease and cognitive impairment ha that has been tested on generating or processing nouns versus verbs showed a more pronounced deficit for verbs. with a difference in performance of up to 50%, up to 50%. Similar word retrieval problems affecting especially, specifically verbs, have been repeatedly found in other movement disorder, such as Parkinson's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, progressive supranuclear palsy, palsy, <laughs> and cortical basal degeneration. as well in, as in other rarer conditions. We saw earlier that disrupting the speech motor cortex disrupts comprehension of action words, of action words. That is not, however, because verbs are simply the first to go whenever there's cognitive in impairment. 
Indeed, the reverse is generally true. Though children acquire nouns before verbs, once acquired verbs are tenacious. In cognitive impairment, impairment adults tend first to lose not verbs but nouns, but nouns. But nouns. While it is true that some forms of dementia spare nouns, some spare verbs and some spare neither. Nouns are generally more vulnerable than verbs. Generally, more vulnerable than words, than nouns, than verbs. The first description of someone who had lost the use of verbs was made in 1744 by the philosopher Giambattista Vico. Giambattista Vico. Giambattista Vico, there's a good man living among us who, after a severe apoplectic stroke, utter, utters nouns, but has completely forgotten verbs, completely forgotten verbs. By an odd coincidence, the first description of the converse, laws of noun retrieval, was made in the following year. 1745, by the botanist and physician Carl Linnaeus, as far as we know, he had no knowledge of Vico's case. The cognitive deficits that accompany motor diseases may be an 
inalienable consequence of the close connection between action and thought. The close connection between action and thought. I alluded in chapter 12 to the well-known Hebbian formula in neuroscience that what fires together, wires together. That is to say, repeated use of a particular neural pathway causes structural changes which further facilitate its future use, its future use, its future use. Since we now have evidence that neurodegeneration may spread along the reinforced synaptic connections created by this process, Bach has coined the phrase, what wires together dies together. It seems clear, however, that the key difference is not, gr not a grammatical one. Nouns versus verbs as such, but an experiential one, but an experiential one. Inasmuch as nouns tend to suggest objects, and verbs tend to suggest action, action. The brain's connections between thought and motion are mediated through imagined experience not through linguistic rules, not linguistic rules. Motion and cognition. What the cerebellum can teach us Until the last 50 years, the cerebellum or ancient brain which lies below and behind the cerebrum or new brain was thought to be more or less confined to the to coordinating motor behavior, motor behavior.
Its name means the little brain. It has only about 8 to 10 percent of the volume of the cerebrum, of the cerebrum, of the cerebrum. Yet it contains an astonishing 80 percent approximately of all the brain's neurons of all the brain's neurons. This is particularly striking since as the number of neurons increases, the number of connections does so exponentially, does so exponentially, exponentially. To move it, why is it upside down? Hmm. Sorry, it's a bit upside down here. This is particularly striking since as the number of neurons increases, the number of connections does so exponentially. Exponentially, exponentially. <laughs> it seems unlikely that this vast complexity, so much greater than that of the cerebrum, what we normally think of as our brain is devoted entirely to finessing motor control. It is of no little interest incidentally that while consciousness can be sustained by just a fraction of the normal volume of the cerebrum, the entire cerebellum with its vastly greater interconnective, interconnective potential 
cannot sustain consciousness on its own. On its own. In recent year, we have come to learn that the medial cerebellum, in particular, the central part known as the vermis, plays a key role in emotional and social interaction. Abnormalities of the cerebellar vermis, of the cerebellar vermis, and the medial cerebellum more generally, more generally, have been linked to autism and similar affective and social disorders, social disorders. <laughs> there is a particularly close <laughs> relation between movement and social cognition since thought, feeling, and social connectedness depends on and in turn reinforce shared resonances of movement. both in action and perception. <laughs> At the same time, principally lateral cerebral regions have been linked to a variety of more purely cognitive deficits. There are close links between the cerebellum and all parts of the brain. We know that projections from cortical areas direct to the cerebellum and to the pons, the part of the brainstem that forms the bridge between the rest of the brain and the cerebellum, and the cerebellum are concerned not only with motor functions, but with an array of non-motor functions, including spatial awareness, spatial memory, higher order visual processing and language and language and language and language and language
In relation to time intervals, the cerebellum is important for the perception, not only as was once thought for the execution of motor responses to them, of motor responses to them, of motor responses to them. There are also projections from many areas in the prefrontal cortex, the most lately evil part of the brain. To this ancient brain, projections which are critical for what we conventionally consider the highest order processes, including complex reasoning, judgment, attention, and working memory, working memory. Pontine nuclear exchange information of motivational and effective significance with association areas throughout the brain in many modalities. In many modalities. In many modalities. Modalities. It is now beyond doubt that an important role is played by the cerebellum in the acquisition of higher order cognitive, affective and social skills. And in earlier chapter, I refer to its possible role in creativity, in creativity. What a wonderful ending here. I'm going to pause on page 984. Let's have some look into some outtakes that we can take from the text. Let's see, what do we have? What can here be found? What can we here find? Well, we have interesting quotes on already page 981. And how there is an astonishing evidence corpus showing to that every word is motorly engaged in reality.
an array of evidence that takes the argument further in his intelligence in the flesh. And further, we think through the body, writes Matt Crawford. So the body is the interact, fractal interactivity with the exogenous side. To be compared to the idea that our body slash mind is just a dot in the Newtonian orthogonal system of three perpendicular axes, X, Y, and Z. That is really a quite distinct difference being not the same to any extent. The body is the surficial liminal zone between the inside and the outside. Not an idea of an object, nor the body being its insideness, nor rather its surface its fractal surface, not to be found in the inside, nor in the idea of an object being, uh, so to speak, inside the orthogonal perpendicular XYZ diagrammatical system. If that is opened up, we get uh, the fractality as a whole. And that goes for both time and space combined, if you like, or set together, showing how this could reinforce each other. And that is in the fractality. Becoming stronger and stronger. You go down to the bottom of page 981, the penultimate paragraph, under motion and cognition in the brain. We know that just thinking about a certain activity motivates parts of the brain connecting with performing the action and causes subtle changes in the tone of the relevant musculature, of the relevant musculature. So every thought is a bodily action. It includes the fractality of the body to a great extent. So movement is cognition. Cognition is the entering of one surface into another. Not uh, <laughs> that was scornfully mentioned here by Ian McGilchrist, the brain in the that idea. Consciousness as being a point somewhere, somewhere in the open space of the Newtonian perpendicular axis. No. It's alive, and that thanks to fractality and nothing else. And we go into the cerebellum, and the cerebellum can teach us that movement is consciousness itself. And how one tenth of the volume of the cerebr cerebrum can actually contain 80% of the brain's neurons. This shows how only motion can carry the complexities, the enormity of what our consciousness is. And I think 
the former idea that there are more neural connections than atoms in the universe needs to be replaced. I think when motion is implied, it is much, much more of complexity allowed or possibility uh, or made possible. It is in extremely much more. And that's an incredible difference. And going to page 984, and how perception is not something, <laughs> in the old idea, something passive, it's just a recipient of the outsideness. And how consciousness in that case is just almost like a video camera. Many people today think that we are like video cameras or photographic apparatuses. We just take in the outsideness. This is nothing further from the truth is shown by the cerebellum. We need movement. And as shown by in McKilchrist earlier in the text, any deficiency in movement in the person like MS, Papsi, Parkinson, will affect our possibility for cognition as well. There's a close connection to our movements and what we understand. And I can also refer to Pfeiffer here, the Swiss engineer who showed that movement contains so much more of an information storer and also prognosis giver. Nothing compared to a computer. It's much more than a computer. A computer is nothing in comparison. The static idea of ones and zeros registering the outsideness of the world. That's the schizophrenic view so often pointed to in the master and his emissary. And then even further developed in the matter with things. Autism that is also today becoming progressively common is structured on, around the idea of an absolute outsideness where we have no connectivity at all. It is just sheer outsideness. That is in itself the problem. That is the syndrome. The deficiency lie in that circumstance. Less movement, less happy movement, so to speak. There is no joyous movement. I think I'll end here on this note. Say thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing. Sorry for it was upside down. Well, thank you for joining in. Have a very pleasant morning, day or afternoon, wherever you are. Bye-bye for now.